First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. It's a beautiful country. Um, so today we want to talk about writing code that lasts, right? Or as I like to call it, writing code you're not going to hate tomorrow. Now, first of all, elevator pitch. Um, if any of you are looking for jobs and you want to move to Amsterdam, uh, I work for Usabilla. I'm a lead backend developer there. It's an amazing company. We work with uh, voice of customer solutions. So essentially, if you see this little feedback button on the side of a website, you can then click it and give feedback Get, get, f get feedback from your clients, uh, that's what we work to, right? We work towards making a better internet by allowing your clients to tell you what is wrong with your website. If you've seen Nespresso Italy, you've probably seen that button there. That's one of our, our, our clients here in Italy. So if you want to come over to Amsterdam, uh, you know, see some of these things we do here, uh, come talk to me, talk to Luis, we'll be talking about JWT tomorrow. Uh, we'll be happy to, uh, you know, take any questions. So apart from that, because you don't care, um, where do I want to start? So first of all, I think we should go a little bit further in the past, right? Because in the past, there was this uh, guy called, Ra you know, Past Raphael. And Past Raphael made lots of mistakes. He was an idiot. He had no idea what he was doing, you know? He didn't know what tests were. He just kept, you know, writing classes that had 500 methods. It was, it was amazing, right? How many of you have that past experience with yourself. You remember this? Oh, yeah, the great code you used to write. Like, you go, uh, go look at your history, you open up one of your old repositories, and then the first reaction you have is, ah, what was I thinking, right? Or maybe it's not even one of your repositories. You open up the repository of someone else, you open up code someone else wrote, and you're like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Why did I do this? Why did we do this, right? And then we get the, uh, the famous instinct that every developer has, the mission that we were put on Earth to do, which is rewrite everything we see, right? <laughs> hey, I, I'm a good developer. I can do this better. I will rewrite everything. How many of you feel like that? Right? How many of you, how many of you think that's possible? <laughs> right? <laughs> Because the problem is, once we start talking about rewriting all the things, we have to remember that um, you know, we have clients. And that the other thing we need to think about is that real developers ship stuff, right? People keep telling us this. Whenever you say, look, you need to do testing, you need to do this, you need to do that, everyone comes back to you and says, but you know, real developers ship stuff. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. How many of you believe that the entire focus of our community is to ship stuff? No one? No, eh? How many of you think is like shipping is like really important? And you want to get paid. Now, I believe there's something to be said about both attitudes, right? I mean, we come here, we come to conferences, and we hear people talking about this wonderful world where we do everything correctly. And that's not necessarily the case for most situations. But then we come to these other places, and people are like, oh, no, no, forget all these things. We just need to ship. Now, there's a bit to be said about both. So this is a story about uh, a bridge in the United States. Uh, this is the Tacoma Narrows uh, River. And around 19 in 1940s, they built a bridge to cover the Narrows. Now, this was one of those just ship it projects. They hired a company. Look, I need a bridge. They're like, OK, well, I know bridges. They start on one end. They come to the other. They have pillars. And you can cross rivers, you know, like you do with like WordPress templates. This template looks good. Put it there, right? Just ship it. They shipped it. So this was around July of 1944. It was great. They put the bridge there. It worked. Uh, the project was really good. You know, they had an idea of what to Great. Then, on one day in November, four months after it was built, the wind picked up a little bit more. Imagine that you have a website and a little bit more users come into it. Same thing, right? They had a little bit more wind than they were expected. So, I went to engineering school, and I can definitely tell you, this is not what a bridge is supposed to be doing. <laughs> I, I know that much. Right? So in a situation just a little apart from the usual, um, 
this started happening. Now you can imagine that this is the point where your server is screaming, you know, Nagios is sending SMS to everyone. Picture this is your website. Let that sink in a bit. That's probably not good, right? So just shipping it is also not a solution, right? We need to be able to deliver uh, on pace with what we need, with what our, cl our clients actually need, because that's, that's who matters to us, because they're the ones paying us. If you don't have clients, success. Who is paying your bills, though? <laughs> Tell me. Um, but you also want to be able to ship quality. You want to be able to ship and understand that if something different happens, your website is able to deal with it. Your system should not go crashing down, right? So we need to find a balance on how we do this with code. How can we perfect the way uh, we do this? So in talking about how we make code that's going to you know, go into the future, we also need to understand why is it that code keeps running into problems. So the first thing I found is that code has an expiration date. Code is not going to last forever, no matter what you do. Right? It's, like, it's like perishable items. It will go bad. It, you know, if you eat pizza right now, it's going to be great. If you eat it tomorrow morning, it's still pretty good. If you eat it in a week, depends on the pizza, though. I'm <laughs> quite convinced that uh, Verona pizza is, is different from that. So, but still, you know, this this thing it, it, it rots over time, and the same thing goes for code, right? Over time, code will go bad, not just because you know you did something wrong. Sometimes that's just the nature of it. Because the thing is. Code evolves, right? If you look at our industry, at what we're doing now, we have evolved over the years how we do things, how we approach problems, how we talk to each other, what kind of problems we're solving, right? I mean, we're talking about scales today that were simply not existent in the 50s or 60s. Right? That, that whole scenario evolves. The languages we work for, you know, with, they, they evolve. How many of you are working with PHP 7? Right? How many of you wish you were working with PHP 7? It's really cool. You want all that new and shiny there, right? You want to be able to use all these new functions. You want to get up to PHP 7.1, 7.2. You, you want all these new things because the language is evolving. It's giving you better tooling to solve that same problem. So the problem you solve today in a PHP 5.3 version, you could solve in a completely different way in PHP 7. So there's evolution there. But apart from that, the other thing is that you also evolve as a developer, right? If you look back at the code you wrote in the past and you don't feel like it was bad, that means the code you're writing now is the same as that. That's probably not good, right? You want to look back at what you did and say, I can do better than that now. Because you learn as you evolve, you know, as you go into this industry, as you go to more conferences, more user groups, you talk to more people, you evolve. You learn new things. You learn how to do things better. I mean, does anyone here think they write the same code they did at the first time they tried it? Good. Keep it that way, right? You want to keep pushing. So essentially, writing code that, you're, you know, that you hate tomorrow is actually a good thing. You want to hate the code that you wrote in the past because you want to keep evolving within that industry, right? Um, something else that really hurts this process is usually you interact a lot with other people's code. Uh, and this is where comprehension comes in, right? If you do not understand other people's code, how are you going to work with it, right? So the more complexity that goes into a software project, the harder it is for someone to understand what the code is doing, what it needs to be doing, and how you can get from one to the other, right? The other thing that really hurts uh, code from the past is just plain bad design, right? <laughs> it, it, you know. <laughs> Some things are just meant to go wrong, right? So if, you, if you're not planning, if you're not using, if you're not establishing the roots of what we call you know, proper design nowadays, um, that code is going to go bad even faster. Um, same thing goes for having clients, because the one thing that clients are always ready to give us are bad specs, right? Clients are, come on, clients were put in the world to change their minds, right? How many of you have had a client that never changed their mind? Okay, good. I was going to ask for the contact, but that it, it just doesn't happen, right? This, th this is the nature of things. Clients, they, they will change their minds because the market, the world we're living in, again, it's evolving. It's changing, right? This is why we came up with Scrum. The whole idea is we need to be able to change, uh, react to change fast because change will come every single time. I guarantee it to you. 
right? So having bad specs to start with is like, okay, how do you deal with that knowing that what you started working on is not going to be what you're going to deliver in the next few weeks or months? And then finally, we have another um, uh, factor, which is NIH. Any of you familiar with NIH? What is it? Not invented here. The great uh, German art of saying that anything they haven't built sucks. I can say that because I'm German. Um, and it's funny how this actually works very well there. Um, but that's it, right? We always feel we can do the best thing possible. So why am I going to use someone else's code? I can do better. I'll just rewrite it. I'll create my own framework, right? That's the, 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 the what everyone does, right? Uh, and this really hurts us because you're now spending time on solving a problem that has already been solved as opposed to just, you know, fast tracking to what you actually need to solve, which is your own business's problems, your own business problems, right? That's, that's what you want to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So knowing all of these, right, this is, these are all the things that lead us to hate all that old code, right, to really want to rewrite everything. So knowing this, I have come to you today with the answer. I have come with the solution. Forget everything you know. No, that's, that's, that's not true. There is no solution. There just isn't a solution for this because it's not actually a problem. You want the code that you wrote yesterday to be something you want to rewrite today. That's the trick. You want to look at code and say, I can now do this better. Question is, how does rewriting it happen? Because right? that's where the real problem is. If you want to change code, fine, change code. But if you have to spend more resources in changing the code than you did writing it in the first place, that's not healthy. You're not moving forward. You're stuck in that loop. Right? Refactoring is part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we need to do is we need to improve code, right? And the way to do that is we have to, you know, make it ready for change, make it easier to change, make it easier to adapt, make it easier to work with it in the team. So first of all, make it easier to comprehend. This allows your team to work with you and allow you to move forward faster, better. If everyone understands what's going on there, instead of rewriting everything, they can make the change that they need to do, right? The other thing is making code reuse uh, flexible. Right? That means the same code that does A can do B, or that means that the we can easily change a module for another. We can swap around. Hey, I no longer need to support this payment provider. I need to support this payment provider. That transition should not take longer than the first provider actually took. Right? Um, the other thing is make code tested. Not testable. I will tell you that any code you write is testable. Even if it takes years, you can still test it. But if you're taking longer to write the test than you did to actually write the code, that's not productive. That, that makes people stop testing. Right? This is the number one thing for why companies do not adopt testing is because it takes too long, there are too many resources involved. If you write code that's easily testable, that's not an issue. Right? You tend to walk into it a lot easier. You don't, there's no resistance from the team. So you have to make it tested. You have to make it easy to replace, easy to refactor. Right? You want code to be able to change something here, and not everything falls out on the other end. That's, that's what you need. And finally, and if I can give you one solution that is the real solution to all these problems, is you just make code not exist. Can't have problems if you don't have code. Right? Less code, less problems. So. That, that's one place to start, but hey, that's it's what we do for a living, so we have to have code, right? So I want to walk you through a couple of things that are really important for you to think about when writing code that I guarantee you will make your code more future-proof. Future-proof is a hard term, but will make it easier for you to walk into the future with that code and, and, and find less resistance. Some of these things are Easy things, we'll just talk about them. And then I want to get into one thing in, the in, in specific, which really changed how I do coding. Um, but I'm ahead of myself. So first thing you want to do for all of this to become possible is you need testing. If you're not testing, it's just really hard to move forward. Because the thing is, can anyone tell me what the main feature of testing is, like why you do testing? Design? Confidence. That right there is the thing that testing is all about. 
it sure it forces good design it forces code quality uh, it brings a lot of that but before all of these things it brings you developer confidence it allows you to make a change to your code knowing that everything is still doing what it should do right because refactoring like i said is part of what we do now if you don't have testing you cannot guarantee that your refactoring is actually changing only that thing and refactoring without tests is just changing stuff around. Right? You're just shifting things here, there, and it's like you don't know if it's still working, if it was not working. So you want to have tests to give you that confidence that you are able to affect this entire part of the system without something else falling apart. Right? Otherwise, you're just doing you know, code Jenga. You don't want to do that. Code Jenga is bad. By the way, this is Davide. He's from uh, Padua, I think. Works at Usabilla. So if you want to be his colleague, <laughs> just saying, <laughs> you know where to go. Um, so good design concepts, right? That's also something we need to carry with ourselves. Uh, we need to understand how to write code in a way that, that you know, it's easy to understand and easy to ad adjust into the, the stuff we use. How many of you are familiar with solid and stupid? Right? This is like a mantra we keep repeating. I'm pretty sure there are going to be five talks about this over the next couple of days. Uh, it's something that really you need to bring into how you write code and, and what you do. Right? Things like the single responsibility. Um, uh, speaking of single responsibility, you want your code to do one thing, and you want it to do that one thing very well. Right? If you look at what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, if you look where the problems are, if you look where the resistance is in your code, um, I'm pretty sure all of them will map out to one of this. Right, things like dependency inversion. This is what brought the entire uh, dependency injection container scenery into PHP. Right? Passing stuff into objects as opposed to instantiating things everywhere. Right? All of these, and I'm not going to get into details, otherwise we'll be here for way longer than we should. Uh, but these are all things that help you write code that allows all of these changes to happen. Right? So if you haven't looked into them, go look into each of these. They all have a very specific role within uh, writing code, and I'll give you how this interacts with, with another idea I have in the future. Um, the other thing we need to know is design patterns. Right? So design patterns are like cookie cutters, right? like templates of solutions that people have come up with. Now, using a design pattern is not about copying someone else's solution, it's about writing solutions in a mindset that is shared by more than one developer. And this is where comprehension really plays a role, right? You want to be able to look at a code and understand, oh, okay, this is how we're solving this problem. If you use things like design patterns, it's a lot easier for everyone to understand how you are approaching that problem and how you're trying to solve it, right? So all of these design patterns that you're going to see out there, um, they all have a role to play. It's a book about this fic and 50 million different articles in Wikipedia. Just, just go look them up, get familiar with them. If you haven't led, uh, read the, uh, the Gang of Four book, Read it. Try to not sleep while you're reading it. It's not the best reading material out there. But I guarantee you that understanding those concepts will be something that will help you within your career. Right? Even though it's a bit hard. There are better books where they, well, there are books that go a little bit easier if you're getting into this. If you've been doing this for five, ten years, you probably know most of the design patterns already. You just don't know the names of it, which is my everyday thing. I cannot name a design pattern for the, it's just impossible. But I know what they look like, right? I can identify it, and when I, when I look at the code, I can say, okay, this is that pattern. I don't remember what the name of it is, and I'll come up with ridiculous names to try and explain them. And um, Louise is the witness, because he loves correcting me when I do that. Uh, but at least you know the patterns, and that's what the important thing is, right? Uh, other things that are coming up within uh, the community lately uh, that are worth keeping an eye on is domain-driven design. How many of you have actually looked into domain-driven design or, or, or do it on an active basis? Right, there's a lot of hands already. So domain-driven de design has one big ability, which is the ability to bring your code, what you're doing, closer to your business so that both you understand the business better and the business understands a bit better of what you're doing. Right? This, this really helps in communication. It really helps get everyone on the same page, so make sure you're, right, you're solving the right problem and not the wrong one. The other thing that's coming up a lot is, is the module architectures. So things like CQRS, event sourcing, things that allow you to swap pieces a lot better. How many of you know CQRS? Cool. 
If you don't, uh, Marco is giving a uh, talk about that with uh, proof. Is that this afternoon, I think? Yeah, go check it out. It's a really good talk. It's also a really good workshop. Uh, it's a really good concept. Uh, it's something that we're using at Usabilla to start uh, attacking our legacy code and start separating it. This forces you to have better abstraction layers and allows you to really start thinking of what each part of your system needs to do. So these architectures really help guide you uh, into, in, into, these, uh, into understanding code and, and structuring it in a way that's going to make all of this easier. So the other thing. Package managers, right? We talked about not invented here um, and we how we want to get rid of that. And the thing you do to replace that is Pi. Proudly invented elsewhere, right? Using someone else's code. It just it just makes sense, right? Open source is all about sharing, uh, is all about not repeating the same problem over and over and over and over again, but finding new things. Right? So Composer is around. Composer is an amazing tool for helping you use someone else's code. Um, do I dare ask for a raise of hands on who uses Composer? Okay, there we go. Um, I mean, it's just a good idea, right? Um, other things you want to be careful with is, is, is like readability. Um, I mean, it's still, we are humans, and whenever you read someone else's code and you do code reviews, um, essentially you're doing is, is human parsing of that code, right? So things like having paragraphs, having blo blocks of code, really help in that understanding, uh, and using white space is also really important, right? Cool. So these are some ideas. They're generic ideas. I just wanted to expose you to some of these. And but you probably want something more practical. Really helps sometimes, right? So over the years, uh, I've been looking a lot into this, uh, into this problem. And I was working with uh, Guilherme Blanco and Otavio. Guilherme is from uh, Doctrine. How many of you use Doctrine? There you go. So Guilherme Blanco is one of the crazy people writing it. Um, and while we were working in the SWAT team uh, to try and figure out these things, it was great. We didn't have clients. We just worked for work. I don't know. I don't know where the money came from. Apparently, we ran out of it at some point. Uh, but it was great while it was there because we had a chance to really approach coding from a more um, academic point of view, right? Really identify how can we make all of this better within teams, within companies. We would like cooperate with other companies to understand how their teams worked. And we came across a concept called object calisthenics. How many of you have heard of object calisthenics? OK, good. I still have a lot of audience then to talk about this. Uh, the idea of object calisthenics is, so calisthenics uh, means exercises, right? These are small exercises that you repeat over and over to help you achieve a bigger goal. Same thing with object calisthenics, right? They're, they're a way of approaching writing object-oriented object code that will help you fix bigger design issues down the road. Now, they're not rules, and I'll sometimes mention them as rules, but they're not rules, they're exercises. It's very important. They're exercises. So if you follow them, think of this as a workout, right? Spend a month trying to do object calisthenics, uh, following the rules I'm going to show you. There are a set of 10 rules. And then look at how you design code. Look at how that affects the way you design code, and then evaluate it. So again, it's a set of 10 rules. It comes from a book called The, um, the ThoughtWorks Anthology. Uh, it was written originally for Java by a guy called Jeff Bay. Uh, so we adapted them a little bit to PHP, some changes here and there. Uh, but mostly I have reverted to the original Java uh, rules now because PHP has caught up and has a modern uh, object-oriented uh, engine that can solve this. So let's go. Number one, only have one level of indentation per method. One level. That means if you hit tab twice, you're out. Don't do that, right? Sounds a bit ridiculous, right? But the idea behind this is it forces you to really follow the single responsibility principle, right? If you, if, if you can't go more than one level deep in a method, the chances of your method doing more than one thing are very small because there's just so much you can do with code, right? If you keep within that method, you'll see that you start making methods that are a lot simpler, a lot smaller, a lot easier to manage, and that really helps. Um, I do have one exception for this, in case you were wondering. Uh, try-catch blocks. Usually, if you have a try-catch block, I ignore that because sometimes it just doesn't go in there, but that's okay. Again, exercises, right? You want to force yourself to try and keep to this. So rule number one, okay? okay? Rule number two, and this is where things get interesting. Do not use the else keyword. 
Okay, how many of you think I've gone nuts? Okay, a couple of hands. That's better than usual. Um, so, okay, what, am, what do I mean with this, right? What's the, what, the, what has else ever done to you that you, uh, you, you hate it so much? So let me give you some code examples to figure this out, right? So we have this example of a uh, Symfony blog post, a Symfony controller uh, method. So essentially, you know, it's an entity, it, it gets the form, validates the form, does some repository stuff, and then saves it to the database and does some error checking. Take in that code, right? This is a simple method. Have you written something like this in the past? Right? This looks like what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, let me point you to this. This right here, these two lines, are the entire goal of this method. The object of this method is to save this into the database if all the conditions are okay, and then redirect you somewhere else. Everything else around it, all of this, is error handling. Right? It's checking if, if, if it's a duplicated post, it's checking if, if the fields are invalid, if you don't have all the details you need. All of this is error checking, right? So, hmm, maybe this shouldn't be there. Uh, more than that, so we look back at this, how can we get rid of all the else's, right? So here we have an else, here we have another else, how can we get rid of these else's? So rewrite this, we get rid of the else's, right? It looks the same, we have that same block there. Uh, but now I inverted the uh, conditions of the ifs. So what I'm checking for is not if the code does what I want it to do, but I'm checking the opposite. I'm checking, it does this thing not conform to the rules I have set out? So if it's not valid, do something else. If it's already in the database, do something else. Right? You're inversing the way you think about that. And if you look at this now, you see that you have an exit condition here. Right? You have another exit condition there when the code is duplicated. And you have now mapped out all the situations where your code will not do what it needs to do. Because at the end of the day, it needs to save. That's it. That's everything your code wants to do. Everything else is now telling you this, these are the conditions that I'm not going to do this. Right? And then you can take this a step further because I said methods are supposed to do one thing, right? So we don't need all these things here. We can extract them. Oh, but you're not checking for errors. Yes, I'm not. However, I mean, how many of you know Symfony? Right? How many of you know PSR 7? PSR 15 or whatever they're calling it now. Right? Middlewares. So if you extract the validation and the uniqueness into middlewares that kick in even before this method kicks in, you can now solve all these things outside of this method, and your method will now do literally save and redirect. Right? All those 15, 16 lines you saw before can now be down into this. Are we still doing? OK, we've moved code somewhere else. So the code didn't vanish. right? I didn't make it go away. But if you're looking at solving a problem within this block, th this method here, it's very straightforward what it does right now. Right? You can go into here and say, oh, yeah, that's what it does, and this is what I need to fix. You have to deal with a lot less code. You have to deal with a lot less context that is not relevant. Oh, I have a problem with my form validation. Well, go into the middleware. That's exactly where your problem is going to be. Your problem is not going to be in here. Right? Does that sound crazy still? Makes more sense now? Good. Good. Right, so PSR7 really helps with these things. Right? Essentially what we did with this code is instead of making it this complex thing, we now have breakpoints. We now have exit points. You can do early returns, you can throw exceptions, you can do whatever it is you want. What you're saying is my method has a purpose. The purpose is to do this. Anything else that I will stop me from doing this is now an exit point. My method will not handle this. It's not supposed to be handling how the error shows up on the user. Uh, it's not supposed to be, you know, talking to the database and doing a bunch of other things. Right? Pass those on, let another method take care of it, another class. You break your stuff into more pieces. Cool. Number three is wrap your primitives in, 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 in objects. So wrap your primitives. Now this is like, for example, instead of having a string, you take that string and you wrap it in an object. Right? Give you an example. Let's say we have this method here, repaint false. Repaint? But repaint, but don't repaint, right? If you read this without going to the actual method definition, it doesn't make sense. It's like, what? Well, there's obviously a parameter I need to take there. So if I'm in an IDE, it will show me what the parameter is, and yeah, everything makes sense. So what if you're not in an IDE? Do you really want to rely on an IDE to be able to read any code? I mean, sure, we can rely on many things on an IDE, but this is not one of them. So what if I rewrite this as this? 
right? If you look at this method now, you know exactly what's happening. It's going to repaint, and I'm going to tell it not to do an animation while it does that, right? This makes sense, because now you're you know, giving more detail. The other thing that you don't see happening in the background here is if the repaint method before received the true or false to do animation, that repaint method was doing two things, repainting and animation. All that code that handle animation, you can now stick in this animation class. Once you're finished repainting, you can pass it on to the animation class. The animation class does its thing. So the behavior is now all encapsulated within that animate object. If you want to deal with animation, you now know where to go. There's an object right there for it. Right? Make sense? Uh, how many of you have used the um, money PHP package? Right? So the money PHP package is uh, maintained by uh, Matthias Velas, and is essentially a object that represents money. Right? We always think, oh, money, easy, right? We're going to use a, a, a double, right? Double for money? Yeah, I can, I can hear the nervous laughter of everyone who has tried that. It's a good way to uh, you know, get some money back because money goes in different places because doubles and stuff, right? So instead of dealing with that, instead of saying, oh, well, I'm going to send it as a string uh, like or, or an integer, and then I have to multiply it by 100, divide it by 100, blah, blah, all of these things you need to remember to do everywhere, and then you forget because you know, we're human. And it's like, oh, geez, what do I do now, right? Whereas you take something like this, you now encapsulate all of that string representation into an object. That object knows when to you know, go back to integers, come back down to a double representation. It knows how to handle all these things. Right? So that's rule number three. Rule number four is easy. Just have one arrow per line. Now, I'm not against fluent interfaces. You can still use them. Just break a line because you want to be clear that you're calling multiple things. But what I want to avoid is, I mean, if you've ever used Symfony, you know about this, right? Symfony, uh, get, uh, get security, get token, get user. Oh yeah, nervous laughter. You know what, uh, you know what happens, right? Um, it turns out that the uh, get token method may return null. And what happens when you call get user on null? Yes. <laughs> Hopefully you get alerts from your server when you do that. Uh, you don't want to do, again, law of Demeter, right? That was one of the, uh, the, the items in, the, uh, in, in Solid. You don't want to know too much about the objects in there. So restrict yourself to not calling, you know, in, 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 in. Just talk to that first object, right? Tell, don't ask. Yes, that's the right thing. It's always confusing. Uh, cool. Rule number five, don't abbreviate. Do I need to convince any of you? Do you feel really smart when you take that big word and you make it up into three characters? And you're like, yes, great. My line is now shorter. It's amazing. And then tomorrow you try to read it and you have no idea what it means. <laughs> <laughs> you take code like this, where <laughs> apparently New York is retrieving stuff. I don't know. <laughs> or Sysmat. I don't know. Right? Funny thing is that I, I asked for this code online and someone gave it to me. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's a good example. What does it mean? I have no clue. <laughs> so to this day, I still don't know what it means. It, uh, I mean, it is, uh, it is image manipulation. So if I spend half an hour looking at it, you're kind of like, oh, okay, I think these are coordinates. I didn't really know that images had south and north. And then x and y, because, you know, why not mix everything, right? Why keep to one thing? Just don't abbreviate. Come on, right? It, it just... It just giving complexity to the next person uh, looking at your code. The other thing is not just abbreviating, but picking how you name uh, methods. If I give you an obje a, a, a method that says get page, do you think that's a method that will cost resources or not? Like be expensive to run or not? Not, right? It sounds like a getter. I'm reading a property of an object. Should be good. What if I tell you that that get page is actually doing a curl call to a server outside of your infrastructure and returning a page? Are you going to call it five times in a row? Or are you going to store the uh, outcome of it, right? So the way we communicate to each other is through public interfaces. Put a lot of thought into those public interfaces. I'll talk about getters in a bit as well. Um, rule number six, keep your classes small. And I'm saying rule over and over because I'm an idiot, but it's, it's exercise number six. Keeping classes small. This means your class should have 10 methods. Your method should have like 10 lines, 15 at most. 
How much trouble can you get in with 10 lines of code? Plenty, but still less than if you have 50 or 100 lines, right? So you want to keep your classes small. You want to make things simple. Um, so rule number seven is limit your instance variables to two. Do we all know what instance variables are? Okay, so instance variables are like this. You have a service, and you have all of these methods you have injected into it. Each of these properties is an instance variable, right? So you look at this um, object here. What kind of troubles am I going to have here? Any ideas? Too many responsibilities. Uh, if I tell you to write a test for this, how many mocks are you going to write? <laughs> right? It's probably not good. Right? If, if it takes you seven mocks to be able to test a method, eh, you're probably going to skip on testing that method, right? So the idea is this one method is now responsible for so many things. And we're talking about single responsibility everywhere. We're talking about you know, the flow of stuff. You, know, you don't want to do these kind of things. Right? And it's easy to solve this. I mean, if you look at this problem here, um, you know, translation, um, image cropping, these are things you don't need the user to, like especially image cropping. You don't want your user to be waiting for that image to be cropped. I mean, you tell the user, yeah, you were registered, that's great. Meanwhile, you send this off to a queue somewhere. Use an event system, get rid of this. Right, um, user service is that you know. Then we have like the entity manager. Why are you talking to the repository and the entity manager? Right, that's what middleware is for. So you can start moving these things out of this object or wrapping them in, in better processes that can be used in different places. So that's one way of getting rid of those uh, instance variables. Right. Um, rule number eight: use first-class collections. Now, this is a good exercise just to help you uh, deal with collections. The idea is that a collection object should only have collection handling things like you know join, map, reduce, uh, iterate, next, previous. And it has nothing else. Your collection is not this entity of great things that does. Because that means you can now take two collections, combine them, they all have the same interface. When you start pulling things out of your collection, they have a type, and then you can then react on that type. Right? So this just makes for more solid design, allowing you to handle things. And then finally, well, not finally, um, but this is one of the big ones, don't use getters and setters. You may have seen me say the opposite. I have come to the light. I have realized that I was wrong. And I now understand why all these things are good. But also, uh, you know, languages, code has evolved. Um, and this starts making sense now. So the idea between doing this is, you is again, talking about the uh, tell, don't ask um, aspect of code. Um, and it dives into so many other things, right? For example, let's say you here you have a getter and a setter, right? And then you're going to do something like, yeah, set the score to get what the score was and increment to one. Now, if you think about this, you're doing this from outside of the object that's keeping score. Whose responsibility is it to keep score? Probably the score object, right? I mean, it should know the rules of, oh, you did this, so that means you should get five points. Or you did that, and it means you should get two points. If you're doing everything outside of the object, that object no longer controls those rules, right? So your getters and setters are there to create mutability everywhere in your object. Now, getting rid of setters is easy, right? We follow the concept of immutability. Your message objects, they start one way and they go all the way to the end, maintaining that same state. That guarantees that there is no interference going on in the middle. Getter object, I mean, getter properties, maybe there's better ways of doing this. So, for example, take we take this scenario and we rewrite this as collected coin, right? This is if, you, if you're done domain-driven design, if you're done event-driven even, um, you'll start understanding this. So instead of saying, look, increment one to my score, I tell you, look, I just collected a coin. Internally, that rule is now going to say, okay, well, I'll give you one point. Can you imagine if you did it somewhere else? If you went this, if you decided that collecting a coin is now two points, how many places are you going to have to go change that? Whereas you can just change it in one place here, where the rule lies, where there's one place that will talk about your score, right? So this is about communicating a lot more. Instead of just doing a getter, um, why am I getting this method? What am I doing? Instead of like get first name, get last name, is that what your is, is that what interface the interface you want to provide to other classes in your system, right? We tend to think of APIs as being only those HTTP APIs. But every interface you write in your system is an API, is a way that you're communicating to someone else. That can be yourself, that can be a different class, that can be a different 
team. So think about how you're writing these uh, interfaces. And then finally, document your code, right? I mean, that's easy, right? This is not even in the original thing. I just, I just need to repeat this because sometimes people just don't get it. Um, when I say document your code, I do not mean that if you have like an if, you say, well, this, uh, this line here is going to choose between A and B. That's what if means. Probably don't need to tell that to someone else, right? So when I mean documenting your code, I mean documenting the important stuff, right? Code is a tool of communication. It is a discussion between you and other developers. So if your method has a cost attached to it, hey, this method costs because we're going to talk to this server, that server, whatever, maybe that's something you should mention in the doc block. It's not just, this is a string and this is a, a, an integer. Yeah, that's great. But you know, what else do I need to know about this method? Why is this method doing it this way? Because we all know, we look at code and say, oh, I can do this better. But why was it done like that? If you've ever peeked into the insides of the, um, the unit of work in Doctrine, have you done that? OK. This yeah, there you go. So good, right? Great, amazing, great code, right? And you're like, whoa, but if, if, um, if, if Guilherme helped you figure out how to implement all these things, and he's one of the core developers in Doctrine, that code should be better, right? Again, this is where it really comes in. You need to understand these things. This is where documentation goes in. Because if you go into the unit of work, they will explain that that entire piece of code is horrible for one specific reason, which makes a lot of sense in that context, performance. So the unit of work, if you don't know doctrine, and bless you if you don't, because you don't need to know these things, but the unit of work is the thing that maintains all the changes going on within. So it's being called a lot of times within any given request. Right? Which means if that is slow, everything is slow. Right? So that unit of work needs to go really fast. So that's why it's that horrible piece of code it is, but it's really good performing because that's what they needed to do at that point. Right? So this is also understanding when to pick your battles. Right? And documenting is where you share this information with someone else so they don't feel like rewriting the same thing over and over and over and over and over because you know, or you can just you know, let them do it. It's a great, great way to learn. You just don't comment your code, they'll try and rewrite it. They will run into the issues you ran, and then they'll come back and say, oh, this is why you didn't do it. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of why you didn't do it. But you, you know, yeah, they have learned something, so that's also a way to do it. Right? So none of this is important if you don't do it yourself. Right? So this is your turn. You, you have to seize the future of your career, where you want to go in terms of code. Improve yourself. Evolution is really important. You need to evolve as a developer. I mean, you're here at a conference, so you understand that message. I don't have to tell you over and over again, but keep doing that. Also, read lots of code, right? We tend to think that knowing good code from bad code is like a gut feeling. If you haven't seen enough code, you really can't tell what's good or bad, right? It also means you don't know what the contexts are. When is this code good? When is this code bad? Also, writing simple code, right? If you can write smaller, chunk-sized little pieces of code, they're a lot easier to share around. I mean, look at, don't go too far, but look at NPM and all these little tiny libraries. Every library does one little tiny thing very, very well, instead of doing everything, right? The simpler the code is, the simpler that unit is, the easier it is to then move it, share it, use it more. Try this whole thing for a month. Like literally, just, just take these rules, the exercises, and take a pet project. If you can't do it at work, write a pet project and follow all of these rules without exception. Force yourself to follow all of the 10 rules. And, and at the end of that month, look back at how you write code and think if it changed. I started doing this five years ago, six years ago, and it, it changed the way I think about code. It started making me realize complexity and things before I actually get into the entire object tree. Right? So just try it for a month. L do it as an exercise. It's a great way to just, you know, get into it, and then see how that affects the way you design code. Uh, more than that, share code, packages, put packages up there. How many of you have a library up on packages? That's a really small number, right? I'm sure everyone here has something cool they, ha they, they can share with someone else, something that will be useful to someone else in this room. So do share that code, and also rely on your colleagues. You know, Rely on getting code from someone else. If you're looking for JWT, I hear there's a great library for it. 
The offer may or may not be in this room. Probably not. <laughs> this is the point where you have to just make fun of your coworkers. Um, but more than that, uh, thank you very much.